There is no one like you, Lord. Amen, amen, amen. Well, I am thankful to be in service one more time. It's good to be able to wake up, amen, have breath in your bodies, have the activities of your limbs, uh, you're thinking straight, you know how to put your clothes on. Come on, you got out to the house of the Lord today or you, you're sitting in your living room viewing it via live stream. It's a blessing to be here, amen. And so we thank God for each one of y'all. So good to see you in the house of worship uh, as you join with us for this time of worship and celebration. Listen, guys, we're going to continue on with our teaching on commitment to change and commitment to change. But today I want to ask a question because I want to do a deep dive into the mind of Christ. And the question that I'm asking today is, have you lost your mind? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, have you lost your mind? All right. I know some of y'all say, yeah, you sure have. I've, I've been with you for a long time. You are, you are, that's not what I'm talking about. Go to Philippians, the second chapter. And this is a familiar passage because, guys, here's what I understand and I know with clarity, uh, with, with no, without any doubt, that if the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to have the kingdom impact that God designed for her to have in the earth realm, we that are part of the body of Christ have to lose our mind and gain the mind of Christ. Our thinking has to be transformed. And the way we look at life can't be based on our upbringing, our political persuasion, our ethnicity, uh, what street you grew up on, what high school you went to, what college you went to. It has to be based on the mind and the heart of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If we're going to see the type impact that God designed for the church to have. So we're going to go to Philippians chapter number two. We're going to begin our reading there at verse number five. Philippians two, verse number five. Have you lost your mind? We're going to go into a deep dive on, on, on the characteristics of the mind of Christ and, and what do we need to do to develop the mind of Christ? Because if we, if you and I can begin to think like Christ, if you and I become so engrossed and so, so, uh, uh, uh bought into the, the, our, our salvation experience to the point to where we say, for God I live and for God I die, then we'll begin to see radical change in the church. And when there's radical change in the church, there'll be radical change in our communities because the church that is radically changed will go out into the community and begin to affect kingdom principles, amen, wherever it goes. So we got to get our minds right. We got to get our minds right. How many of y'all are willing to admit that there have been times when your thinking has been messed up? I need some hands raised up here. This is a participatory sermon, amen? And I need some hands raised. How many times have you thought your thinking was thrown off? I'm not talking about before you were born again. I'm talking about since you were saved. Just thought some crazy stuff. And the enemy will send crazy thoughts to your mind. And if you don't learn how to capture those thoughts and bring them into captivity, they have a way of just engulfing your life and it'll have you moving away from the things that God would have you to do. Now, y'all remember we start this off in Hebrews, the fifth chapter, where the writer of Hebrews wanted to talk to those, the, the recipients of that letter about some, some deeper things. But he says, I can't do it because you're dull of hearing. He said, at the time, you guys ought to be teaching others. You remember that? Hebrews 5th chapter. You have need to be taught the elementary things of the faith. And God is saying, it's time for many of us who will listen to my voice here, many in the body of Christ, it's time to grow up and stop being a spiritual baby, whining, messing on yourself, crying, taking somebody else's toy. All the things that a baby does. God said it's time for us to grow up and that's not going to happen until our mind is changed. So everybody say, lose your mind. Uh, I think there's that, that, that rapper DMX had a song, y'all going to make me lose my mind. I think he's dead now, isn't he? 
Listen, I don't know what DMX was talking about, but when, when I say I want you to lose your mind, what I'm saying is what Philippians, the second chapter tells us is we got to replace our thinking and our mindset with the mind of Christ. Look at what the text says. You must have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. As a matter of fact, brother, let's go to the King James Version. I love the way the KJV reads on this. Philippians chapter number two, verse number five. Glory to God. Are y'all with me? It says, let, come on, read together. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let's keep reading. He says what? Uh, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, the text says, but made himself for no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. In other words, God wrapped himself in human flesh, was born in a manger in Bethlehem, all right, tabernacled down here for 33 some odd years and went to the cross of Calvary to die a sacrificial death so that you and I could have a relationship, a personal relationship with the God who created the heavens and the earth, because he loved us that much. He gave us his very best. So he been found in fashion as man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. In other words, Jesus, who was part of the triune Godhood, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Jesus came to be born of human flesh so that he could offer a sacrificial death for us. And so what Paul says here, Paul, the writer of the church, the writing this letter to the saints at Philippi, Paul, who wrote with a single-minded purpose. If you guys remember when we studied Philippians, we were amazed at the fact that Paul was so single-minded, Paul was so focused on doing the will of the Father that it didn't matter that he was in jail while he wrote this letter. Paul was so single-minded and focused on, on winning people to the Lord that it didn't bother him Although he knew that others were preaching for selfish motives and selfish reasons. You know that happens in Christianity, doesn't it? My church is bigger than your church. My church got the latest and the greatest program, and yours don't. Who come over here because we got programs. Let me tell you something, baby. A program ain't going to change your life. It's going to take the will of God, the purpose of God, the word of God being digested on a daily basis and being you and allow it to transform your mind and your thinking. We don't want to get into to that. But Paul, Paul was so Paul was so 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 focused and single minded. He says that I know some are preaching uh, for selfish reasons. Some are, 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 are rejoicing that I'm in jail and it gives him an opportunity to preach. But he says as long as Jesus is being preached and people are getting saved, I'm all right with that. Now, guys, that's single-mindedness. That means Paul lost his mind on the road to Damascus. Can I get a witness? And what I'm asking you today is to lose your mind. I'm asking you to lose your Republican mind. I'm asking you to lose your Democrat mind. I'm, I'm asking you to lose your Green Party mind. I'm asking you to lose that mindset that was cultivated and developed in your family of origin, and let's take on the mind of Christ. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you need to lose your mind. Let's go to, uh, uh, if you will, to, to Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 1 through 2. I, I want to look at this from the New Living Translation, Romans, the 12th chapter, verses 1 through 2. The mind, our mindset has to be different, guys. Because God is trying to do some unique things through the body of Christ. And specifically, I believe he's trying to do some unique things through the family of faith here at Elizabeth Baptist Church in the great, big, awesome town of Benton, Louisiana. Can I get a witness? Look at the text. It says what? And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Look at verse number two, number two, I'm sorry. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but watch this, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Let's go to 2 Timothy, the third chapter, verse 16 and 17. I want to show this to you. Because as we do this deep dive into the mind of Christ and developing the mind of Christ and losing our mind, it's critically important that we see what Scripture says. I believe that, that many times in today's society, we have 
the church being influenced by the culture to the point to where the culture, society, is now dictating and determining what's right and wrong versus the pure, unadulterated word of God. And whenever you have that happen, the, the problem with that is, is, is with society, everybody's got an opinion. Touch your nose right quick. Everybody got, touch your nose right quick. Everybody has a nose. You got a nose. And so your nose may be a little bit different than my nose. Some are wider. Some are a little bit more narrow. Uh, whatever kind of nose you got, you have one, right? Everybody's got one. All right. So a nose is like an opinion. Everybody's got one. So if, if what's right and what's wrong is based off of what you feel and what you think, and there is no standard for righteousness, then everybody's got a righteousness. So what I believe, in, and what I believe that the Bible teaches is that God's word should always be our standard for righteousness, and we should not turn the word of God loose. So as we seek to lose our mind and take on the mind of Christ, the scriptures, the holy scriptures, are significant, plays a significant part in us losing our mind and gaining the mind of Christ. Look at what 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17 says. Let's go. It says what? All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. Y'all heard this time and time again. I, I, I repeat this passage over and over again because we got to remember this, guys. It's not what I think and what I feel, but it's what is revealed through God's holy scripture. He says, he's watch, it corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. Verse 17, let's read. God uses it, what is it? The word of God, God uses it to do what? To prepare and to equip his people to do every good work. So if God uses it, the word of God, to prepare and equip us to do every good work, what do you think happens to the believer who spends no time with God's word? He's going to be inadequately prepared and equipped to do every good work. Are y'all with me today? So, so if we're going to lose our mind, we've got to make sure that we realize that, 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 first of all, it is God's will for us to begin to think like Christ. It is God's will for us, you and I, to, 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 to view life through the prism of the word and not our upbringing. And again, I, I, I do, I, I'm not naive enough to, to, to not know that our culture and our upbringing, our family of origin influences us. But we, when we look back at our family of origin, we need to be able to identify that which was not so good, and we got to get that out the way. And that which was good, that lined up with God's word, okay, I can embrace that. I can bring that along with me into my future. But if I had some thinking that was poured into me my, by my parents and my relatives that was not right, I got to let it go. Everybody say, lose your mind. So, so, so we talk about commitment to change. So I want to define commitment for you. And I know y'all, I know y'all are intelligent folks, but just humor me and I'm going to define it for you right quick. Okay. Commitment. The word commitment is, is the state or the quality of being dedicated to a cause or to an activity. So synonyms, which are like words for, for commitment is dedication, devotion, allegiance, loyalty, faithfulness, and attentiveness. That's what it means to commit. We say commit to change. Then we, we, we're talking about being dedicated to it being dedicated, being devoted to change, to allowing God, giving God the, the, the right and the privilege, although God has the right, but guess what? God won't move you unless you yield your will to his. You know, we used to say in the old days, uh, and people used to pray, Lord, make me love my enemies. You know what? God ain't gonna make you love your enemies. As a matter of fact, God won't make you do anything. That's not blasphemy. God won't make you even get saved. If God was going to make us get saved, everybody would probably be saved, wouldn't it? Because it is the will of God in Christ. It is that everyone come to Christ. As a matter of fact, God is, is, is withholding his coming back right now, giving others an opportunity to get into the body of Christ. So, so guys, I need you to understand something. God won't make you do it, but you got the will to do so. You got the will uh, you got to have a desire to do God's will. So, so commit, commitment to change means that I am dedicated to change. Change means the act or the instance of making or becoming different. Over the past years, guys, we've, we've been, y'all been hearing me talk about this time and time again, that we've been focusing on the need for each of us as born again believers to embrace 
the transformation process God wants us to go through. To transform obviously means to change. Now, guys, how many of y'all have went to seminars and conferences? Maybe it's a business seminar or, or a, 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 a seminar or a conference as it relates to spiritual issues. Uh, it may be a, a, a seminar or something that's, that's related to health issues. And you go to those seminars and you sit there and you listen and you take notes and you bring the binder back home with you. How many of y'all ever done it before? Whether, whether it's business-wise or, or, or personal. And you go and while you are there and that speaker who's usually gifted in what he does, otherwise he's usually not invited to speak, he's up there sharing principles. And while he's sharing those principles, you're sitting there getting excited, aren't you? As he tells his story or her story and her testimony, you're sitting there and you're getting excited and you're saying, I can do that too, right? But what usually happens to us? We go back home and we put that binder up on the shelf and maybe, you know, maybe we, we may follow what we learned for two or three weeks, huh? And then after a while, we forget about what we learned and we go back to doing life the way we've always done life, right? What I'm telling you is God is saying, we've been doing the church that way and God is saying, it's time out for us doing things the way we've always done it. Let's change. Let's let the mind of Christ engulf our minds and let's begin to think differently. We got, listen, you can read every self-help book you want to read, but the problem with self-help books, as I told you in the past, is that they tell us what to do, but they can't give us the power to do it. But for believers, the Bible gives us instruction on what to do, and guys, we have power available to give us the strength to do it. That word power is used 57 times in the New Testament. Amen. And it's used to describe the most powerful event that ever happened. That is the, the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Amen. That same resurrection power is available to change our lives. Go to Philippians, the third chapter. And I start looking at verse number, I think I started verse number eight. Philippians chapter three, verse number eight. Watch this, guys. Have you lost your mind? I'm going to tell you, uh, in, a, in a lot of cases, in a lot of situations, guys, if, if we're honest now, again, and I believe in being honest, if we're honest, there are times, guys, that we allow other influences to, to capture our thinking, don't we? I'm going to say this, and, 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 and you can do what you want to do, because this ain't in the Bible, but, but I'm, I'm going to say this, and I believe it's wisdom. Guys, turn the TV off. Don't sit there and, 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 and watch 24-hour news cycles, uh, hearing stuff repeated over and over again, because what begins to happen is what you listen to on the news begins to get down in your spirit, and you begin to look at life through the prism of what you see on CNN and Fox News and uh, uh, what's the other one, MSNBC. Hello? Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to, to keep up because I, I, I'm a voracious reader and I, and I, and I, I watch news. But what, here's what I learned. Even, even myself, I had to pull back from watching so much news because it, it, it's on a loop. Then all of a sudden, you'll find yourself feeling and thinking a certain way based off of what they're reporting. And oftentimes, the news, because they have, only have a certain amount of time to, to uh, share a story, they don't give you the whole story. And they usually shape it to, 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 to fit what narrative they're trying to get over. And guys, what I'm telling you is don't ever look at life through the prism of what you see in the, in, in the news. Not only the, 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 uh, the network news and cable news, but what you see through social media. By God. I mean, social media, I mean, I'm, there, there's a, again, I'm not knocking it, but I'm saying it can be a tool that's used for good. But don't y'all realize that everything that shows, that's, that's put out there on Facebook and, and Instagram and Twitter, it's not all the truth? Don't you know that you have people who have Facebook personas? You look at them on Facebook, they're like they're the, the most happiest couple in the world. Look like they're just living large. And if you talk to them individually, they're miserable. When's the last time you went out there and put something out there that was negative about you on Facebook? Huh? Unless you were really hurting. Now, somebody's really hurting, and if got fooled, they'll go out there and just vent 
which is not the best place to do it anyhow. Find you a counselor or somebody you can talk to and don't go on Facebook venting your frustrations. Can I get two witnesses out there? Can I get two people who will say, Pastor, from this day forward, I'm going to stop venting and stop throwing out at people over social media. That's not even biblical. I'm going to say it again. If you are doing that, you are out of the will of God. Because Jesus told us explicitly that if there is an alt or disagreement between you and a brother, you go to him one on one and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Then you gain your brother. And if not, you take two or three more spiritual people with you and then you bring them before the church. You go through a process of, of dealing with an issue, but don't go out there and throw stuff out there because you're frustrated. Amen? I tell you what you need to do is you need to, if you missed it, you need to sign up for emotionally healthy spirituality and emotionally healthy relationship and learn how to do relationships better. Learn how to love well. When you learn how to love well, we you learn how to interface with people even though we all are fallible. How many of y'all got some sin? Look at me. Come on, come on. I know you're saved, but how many of y'all got some sin in your life? How many of y'all have some ways of thinking that has to be modified to fit the way Christ thinks? All right? So we got to learn how to love well. And that's what we learn to, we, we, we base it on scripture, but we also got tools to help us to learn how to face people, to interface with people, to learn how to go to people and to begin to, 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 to do relationships the right way and not sit back and ponder and, and pout and, and gossip and do all this other stuff. God wants us to do it his way. Now watch this, watch this, guys. Are y'all with me? Here's Paul. Watch what Paul says. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counted it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. Look what it says, and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I, became, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on what? Faith. Verse number 10 is what we're going to get to. Watch this. Look at what it says. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death. The KJV says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. So what, 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 is, what, what is Paul? Paul, Paul uses, when he used the word mighty power, Paul uses uh, the Greek word for power, which is dunamis. Uh, and y'all have heard me share this with you, which is the root word of our word dynamite. Everybody said dynamite. How many of y'all know what dynamite is? Do y'all know what dynamite is? Dynamite does what? It blows stuff up. Right? You use dynamite to, to, to blow something up. And guys, here's what I know. And I, I understand with all my heart, mind, and soul. God, through the power of Jesus Christ's resurrection, wants to blow up our lives. When I say blow it up, he wants, to, he, wants to, he wants our lives to be radically changed and radically different. He wants to, to, to just totally turn it around so that we can be in a position where he can use us mightily. Okay? So, so he used the word, Greek word dunamis, which means dynamite. So Paul is saying God wants to give you and I dynamite power that can change our life. Now, guys, when you look at this, we say that the change, and you outline the change process involves a partnership between you and God. It involves a partnership between you and God. I don't know about you, but it's frustrating when you try to change something and, and it doesn't seem to be changing. It's frustrating when you're in a relationship that doesn't seem to be changed and it's, you're still doing the same stuff the same way you've always done it. And, 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 and all of a sudden you get so frustrated, you say, I'm, I'm out, I'm quit, I've had enough. Any of y'all ever been there before? Well, even if you didn't, Quit it. You thought about it. I need, I need, I, don't, don't even raise your hand because I don't want you to embarrass about it. But just, just nod at me. Just, everybody just nod. Everybody, I, I tell you what you do. Close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. <laughs> if you're online, close your eyes. And, and, if, and if you ever thought about quitting a relationship, just kind of nod your head. Just, just nod it. Just, 
I, I see, I feel you, all y'all nodding your head. Whether it's a marital relationship, whether it's a, a, a employer-employee relationship, there have been times when we thought about just quitting it. We got so frustrated because we said, nothing has changed. Well, I submit to you as a believer, when we're in relationships that don't change, it's because we fail to submit to the power of God and realize that we're in partnership. Change is a partnership process. And you've been trying to change your marriage. You've been trying to change your relationship with your daughter, your son, your, your in-laws. You've been trying to change it on your own. And I'm here to tell you, some stuff ain't going to change with your, with your strength. Some things, like Jesus told his disciples, he says, this, this kind don't come out except by what? Fasting and praying. There are some demons that's messing with some of y'all, and they, they've been messing with y'all for a long time, and they ain't moved. Because you keep trying to do it your own way, in your wisdom. And you got these little tools, you got these little five steps you're going to try. Man, baby, some stuff, you got to pray your way through it. Some stuff, you got to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit, and you got to do some fasting. You got you to bombard the altar of God. You got to get before God and just wail and cry out and say, Lord, I need your help. True gospel change is a partnership between you and God. Everybody say, me and God. We got to change. Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, have you lost your mind? We got to get to that point, guys. Here's the beat of this partnership. It begins with a decision of faith. A decision of faith. Let me see the hands of everybody who's made a profession of faith, who, who've asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart to save you. Okay, you, you, you're born again believer. If you were to die today, you're going to heaven. You sure? I mean, are you double dog? Are you pinky swear? Sure. Are you swear before God? Sure. You remember that? I swear before God. Now listen, guys, here, some people say, well, you, nobody, know. yes, you can know. You can have the confident assurance that if you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he's able to keep you until the day of redemption. The Bible even says this, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption, such that the enemy can't come and pluck us out of Christ's hand. Aren't you glad about that? Aren't you glad that the Holy Spirit seals you? Because some of us, I tell you, sometimes we, we do things, even as a born-again believer, that doesn't, doesn't, it's not indicative of our faith walk. And what God is saying is, it's time for us to change. And it starts with, a decision of faith. And so, so you guys are born again. So let's, let's, let's just watch this. Go with me, if you, real, if you will, real quickly. We know what 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So when it says that, guys, check this out. That doesn't mean that everything and our ways of acting have changed, does it? Because how many of y'all brought some old stuff into the new life? How many of you brought some old habits into your new life of faith? Some of y'all brought some meanness over with you, didn't you? Huh? Still a little meanness. You say, but you got a little mean in you. How many of y'all brought some selfishness over into the new life with you? Yeah, you're a little selfish. Me and mine and mine and mine. And yours is mine. Because it's what I want. Some of us brought some selfishness into the new life with us. A lot of us brought some stuff over in. So when it says new creature, it's not talking about, you know, necessarily physically, but it's talking about spiritually. When you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, there's a new spirit man. A species of being that did not exist before, but now it is a new man, a new creature in Christ. I'm a new spirit man, so now I got to work it out. I got to work the salvation from, from in here to the outside so the people outside can notice something took place on the inside, right? Okay? All right. So, so it says, it begins with a decision of faith. Now look at Ephesians, the second chapter. Look, watch this, guys. We'll go verses one through six. I got to move. It starts with a decision of faith. Ephesians chapter two, it says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus. Watch what it says in verse number two. Let's go. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the command of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Now watch this, guys. Whenever you, I don't care how, how, how long you've known a person and, and, and how, how, how nice a person they are, whenever a person 
goes against what God's word says, then the text says this, the commander of the powers of the unseen world, he is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. What do you mean by that, brother pastor? Well, how many of y'all are in relationship with people or you know people, you work with people, or people in your family who you can show, share with them what God's word says about a particular issue? And they say, well, I just don't believe that. I'm going to do it this way. This is what I think. This is what I feel. And what I feel and what I think is the most important thing to me. Because what man tries to do, man always tries to elevate himself. And man, will, if, if, if man will, will, if he's not careful, present himself as a God. Because it's what I think and what I feel. And, and so, but, so, so what the text says here is, that the, the obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen. Well, there is a little devil, guys. We are engaged in spiritual warfare. And as a believer, we got to learn how to wage war spiritually rather than physically. A lot of us know how to fight physically. You want to throw some hands. You want to pull your gun. But you got to learn how to fight spiritually because some things will not change until you learn how to be a spiritual warrior, putting on the whole armor of God. He's the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Look at the next verse. Let's go. Uh, all of us used to live that way. How many of y'all remember when you were living in sin? It ain't been that long. Go ahead. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we will subject to God's anger just like everyone else. Look at the next verse. But God is so rich in mercy. Glory be to God. And he loved us so much. Text says this, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you've been saved. Now watch this verse. Watch this, watch this. Uh, for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us. Everybody say me. So he says, and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. So in other words, where is Christ today, guys? He's seated on the right hand, where? Of the Father. What the text says, but okay, I'm in the right. He's seated on the right hand of the Father and he's making intercessions for us. But the text says here, he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us in him, seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. So first and foremost, true lasting change comes from having a decision of faith. I'm not talking about just this deciding on your own one day, I'm going to try to do better. No, a decision of faith in partnership with Christ Jesus because when we're in partnership with God, when we're in partnership with, with the God who created the heavens and earth, he gives us dunamis, power to affect change in our life. Now, I shared this with you a, a few months back, and let's just kind of, just by way of review, I told you that uh, God uses some tools to facilitate change in us. The first thing he does is he uses the word. Everybody say the word. Everybody say he uses the word. God uses the word to affect change in us. Um, go with me, if you will. To first, well, we looked at 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Let's go back there right quick and let's, let's, let's focus and dial in on it because the question I asked you when we started this was, have you lost your mind? And your mind, you won't lose your mind just by coming to church. Okay? Thank God that we, we assemble together because Hebrews 10 and 25 tells us, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the man of some is, but come together even more as you see the day approaching. But guys, it, it goes beyond just gathering. If we're going to lose our mind and gain the mind of Christ or develop the mind of Christ, we got to go deeper. We got to dive a little deeper. Thank God for attendance, but God says, I need more from you. Because I got to get you to start thinking like my son. I got to get you to start thinking and viewing life, decisions, situations from the, from the, from the prism of God's word. How many of y'all um, uh, uh, saw that incident that happened with that, um, uh, well, both of those incidents that happened here just recently, the young guy that got killed up in, outside of Minnesota, and then the lieutenant, uh, a lieutenant in the army that was pulled over by the police. But y'all, that was on the, made the national news. And um, recent, 
it was Pat Robinson, I believe, that, that came out and said something, made a very strong statement regarding uh, the, the, the wrongness and the injustice of that. Now, I thought about that. But that, was, that made news because that was out of, quote, out of character for, for Pat Robinson and, quote, the conservative movement to, to talk about wrongness when they see it in our, uh, in our police authorities. And so it, 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 he came out and called it uh, what it was. It was wrong. It's injustice. And he said, we got, they got to do something different. Come on, guys. Now, why do I bring it up? I bring it up because this. At that moment, I'm not talking about any other thing else that Pat Robinson said. You know, he said a lot over the years. Some I agree with, some a lot of I don't agree with. But, but when he said that, he said something that every child of God who's, who's looking at a situation with objectivity and through the prism of God's word, because God hates injustice, right? Check your Bible out. God, God hates injustice. And when you see something like that, you should say something. And the deafening silence from, from, from evangelical preachers is, 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 is just mind boggling to me. Because we can talk about the sin of abortion. We can talk about everything else except what we don't want to talk about. And so I, I applaud Pat Robinson for coming out and saying what he said. But what, what I would tell other ministers of the gospel is call out injustice because God is against injustice. Amen. Can I get two amens up in here? And why is that significant? Because when you start to have the mind of Christ, you let go of everything else and you start viewing life situations from the prism of God's word and not your political persuasion or what's going to bring you power and authority. Amen. Are y'all with me? We got to get the mind of Christ. Because if I'm thinking like Christ, if, if, if the Bible says, let this mind be in you, but it was also in Christ Jesus, if the Bible said like Paul told us, I think it's in Corinthians, and we'll look at it a little bit later on, he's talking about the fact that we should all be like-minded. That don't mean that we going to all have the same personality bent, but guess what? If I have the mind of Christ and you have the mind of Christ, we ought to be thinking alike. Amen. Doesn't that make sense? Yes, if we got the same mind, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ. That means that if I'm thinking like Christ and you're thinking like Christ, then when we view a situation, we ought to think like Christ. Amen. And we ought to say what Christ says and not what our family says, not what our friends say, and not what our cousins say. Let's say what Jesus Christ says. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful. Here's, here it is. Scripture teaches us what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and it teaches us to do what is right. What does that? Come on now. The word. The word. Scripture does. So now watch this, guys. Now think about yourself right quick. Don't think about anybody else, but just think about you. Yes, you. Point to yourself. Say, I got to think about me. Don't look at your neighbor. To, uh, yeah, I, I've told you to look at your neighbor two or three times and ask them how they lost their mind, but don't look at them today. Don't look at them right. Don't, don't, as a matter of don't look at them anymore through the sermon. <laughs> I want you to focus on yourself right now. This text says the word, scripture, God uses it to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It says it makes us Tells us what is true, but it has to make us realize what is wrong in our life. And that caught my attention when I read that because there are many times, guys, when we think we are right. We are so convinced that our way is the right way. And many times our way is in direct contradiction to what the word of God says. So the Bible says here that God uses scripture to make us realize what is wrong in our life. Because we have to be made to realize that some stuff that we're doing is not right. It may feel right, but it's not right. Remember last Sunday, loving you wrong, I don't want to be right. <laughs> All right. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us what to do is right. Verse 17 again. Come on, let's go. This is what, uh, God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do what? Every good work. So God uses the word to change us. Again, but now here's, here's, here's the kicker, guys. If you are a believer who doesn't engage in a discipleship training process, if you are a believer 
who, 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 I mean, I know, I know you, you're saved. If you die, you're going to heaven. But you kind of like, Pastor, you know, I, th that's, that's, for, that's for preachers and deacons and church leaders. I don't need to study that deep. Yes, you do. Because God is going to use the word to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our life. It didn't say he's just going to do it for the preacher. It did not say he's, he's just going to do that for the deacons or the lay leaders. He says, for all of us, God uses the scripture to teach us what is wrong, teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. Second thing he does is he, God uses his spirit, his spirit, okay? He uses his spirit. Go to Colossians, third chapter. Watch this. Colossians 3, verse 1 through 11. Come on, we got to move. And guys, I'm going to try to hit the first three. I may have time to get the first three of the six characteristics of the Christ like mine, but if I don't, we got next week. <laughs> Isn't that the beauty of being able to come together weekly? I, 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 again, I want to do a deep dive because I need, I know for a fact that many of us sitting here have not lost our mind. As a matter of fact, I think I want a t-shirt made up. Have you lost your mind with a question mark? And then put Philippians 2 and 5. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a benediction for somebody, okay? Have you lost your mind? And, and, and as we go around here for the next three, four months or so, just go, hey, brother, how you doing? Have you lost your mind? <laughs> All right? That's going to be on a t-shirt somewhere. Man, how y'all doing? How, how's mom, dad, everybody doing okay? Yeah, doing. have you lost your mind? It's going to throw somebody back who hadn't heard this message. But y'all know what I'm talking about. Listen to me carefully. Any one of us, if we're not careful, the enemy will come in and will, and will try to send thoughts our way to control our thinking so he can control our actions. That's why the Bible says bring every thought into captivity unto the obedience of Christ. So any situation I'm dealing with, I got to run it through the word. I got to wash it through the word. I got to figure out if it's clean or unclean based on what God's word says. And if I don't do that, I'll begin to go based off of what I feel. And, and feelings can be, you know, feelings can be an indicator of God's will for our life, but we don't want to just tr totally depend on feelings alone. Because again, some of y'all have felt like quitting, but God's word says, hang in there. Marriage is honorable and all. I'll tell you before, Maria and I have been married for 35 years, and there been some times she felt like quitting, and I felt like quitting. Yes. Now, if, if, if y'all are honest, and if you're really honest, there have been some times when you've been frustrated, you're like, I'm, I'm through, I'm out. But I thank God that we had enough word in us. Huh? Even as young Christians, I mean, we, we were married, I was 22, she was 20. And we were both selfish. Come on. As I look back on we were both selfish. Uh, we had growing to do. Uh, we didn't really have no models or examples. And, and, and back then, churches weren't even teaching about marriage. I mean, you know, we, that, our church didn't have any marriage ministry. But, but we, we, once we got into the Word and found out that, that the Word of Faith has something to say about every area of our life, our finances, our marriage, our sex life, our uh, children on that line, when we started applying the Word of God, then, then we begin to see deliverance because the word taught us what is true and it made us realize what was wrong in our marriage. And God will do that in every area of your life, okay? So if you feel, if you, if you, you may be here today and feel like quitting. I'm gonna tell you, don't you dare give up. Don't you dare let the, let the enemy talk to you like that and just get inside your head. Because the devil will be able to show and talk, mm, look at that, look at that, look at that. I thought she loved you, I thought he loved you. Mm, look at that, look at that, look at that. Yeah, he, talk, he talks fast like that too. I can imagine. Look at that, look at that, look at that, look at that. That's the devil. Whenever you hear that, that's the devil, okay? <laughs> Guys, whatever comes to your thought life, capture it, put it up against what the Word of God says, and, and if it doesn't agree, smash it. I don't care what you feel. I don't care who told you whatever, but smash it. Let the Word take... Preeminence, because you, you, we're trying to lose our mind up in here, up in here. We're going to lose our minds. 
And as we keep going forward, God's going to do some supernatural things. I believe with all my heart, mind, and soul. And God, because here, we, guys, we live in a culture that's doubtful of the things of God. And so what, I believe what God's going to do is he'll use people who are willing to say, God, I don't care what, it, what people say. I'm going to be true to your word. He's going to use each one of us to affect change in our circle of influence. Watch this. Watch this. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. We know that's what we sitting. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Hmm. Back up. Let's look at that one more time. It says, well, so, so if I got the mind of Christ, then my focus is not necessarily earth-centered so much as it is heavenly-centered with the idea of having influence here on earth. I can't be so heavenly minded that I'm no earthly good. In other words, but what, what it's saying is, it's my thoughts are being filtered through the heavenly realm, through the, through the holy scriptures, okay? Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Watch this, verse 3 says, for you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. So God uses his spirit. Let's keep moving, keep moving. Verse four, and when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in his glory, all his glory. So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. What are the sinful earthly things that are lurking within us? I'm glad you asked. The Bible tells us right here. Now listen, because you're saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost and speak in other tongues, if you do, that does not mean that your flesh is dead. Can I talk to two people up in here who will be honest with me? Sometimes your flesh wants to get loose. I got to come to this side over here because I, I think, I think y'all are honest. They ain't honest over there. I'm just joking. Sometimes your flesh wants to get loose. Saved! You died today, you're going to heaven. But you were on your date. And your flesh wanted to get loose. Watch what it says here. Notice he's talking to the church. This letter is to believers, not unbelievers. Why, pray tell me, what he have to say, what he's just getting ready to say here? Because some of this was percolating throughout the bodies of the body of believers here with the saints at Colossae. Look at what he says. So put to death sinful earthly things lurking within you. It's lurking within you. You got some creepiness in you. Everybody say creepiness. Now I'm using that, I don't mean like weird, strange, and maybe you do have some weird, strange, but I'm talking about, when I say, <laughs> excuse me y'all, creepiness, you know, there, there, there was a term that you should use, it's called creep. Y'all know what it means to creep? Uh -huh, I got some creepers in the house. Uh huh. You, you're, you're on the back side of town over there. 11 o'clock at night. Everybody say creep. Moving undercover, under the radar. Don't want anybody to know you're a deacon at Elizabeth Baptist Church. Over at that place you shouldn't be. Okay. Is this too real for y'all? Y'all tell me now. I'll lighten up a little bit, okay? But I, 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 I got I to gotta, I gotta talk this way because look at what Paul said. Paul didn't lighten up. Paul said, I'm not an eloquent speaker like Apollos. I mean, I don't, I don't know how to rhyme and dime, but I'm going to tell you the truth and I'm going to tell it straight. And how many of y'all like your words straight? Some of y'all used to drink and you like it straight, didn't you? Yeah, I, I feel you. I feel you. Uh -huh. you. You didn't mix your, there wasn't no vodka and all these but you're saved now. So I'm, since you were able to handle your vodka straight, you need to handle your words straight. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. So put to death. Lord, I know I'm running out of time. All right. So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. He's talking to the church. That means that we have stuff lurking in us. I know you're saved. I know you're loving Jesus, but there's some sinful stuff lurking in you that has to be put to death. Otherwise, Paul wouldn't have written this, wouldn't have wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. What, what are those things? He says, have nothing to do with what? 
sexual immorality. That's immoral sexual behavior. Let me say this, and I, I got to say it, parents, you need to start early teaching and talking to your children about their sexuality. Don't you dare say, well, I'm going to wait till they're 14. Guys, let me tell you something. Surveys tell us that, that, that young men who are engaged in pornography usually start as early as eight years old. Did y'all hear me? Yeah. I said eight years old, and you sitting out there letting them stay in the room, just go back there, get on the internet, and do whatever you want to do. And now at eight years old, they've been introduced to pornography, and it's making an indelible impression in their mind. Eight, I said eight. When they're first introduced to it. So you better start talking and, 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 and not leaving it the chance. And please, please, Pray tell me, don't let it, them learn it at, at the locker room Amen. at school. And I'm going to tell you this, it, it doesn't matter what school you go to. There's sin in the school. And there's sin in the camp. And so you can fool yourself into thinking, well, this is the best high school in the parish. <laughs> and they're smoking dope at the best high school in the parish. <laughs> That's old-fashioned dope. Do y'all know what I'm saying? Can I bring a smoking marijuana? Whatever. We, oh, somebody said we. Okay. Somebody said, don't call it dope, Pastor. You like you 95 or something. Okay. All right. So all this stuff happens, guys. So we as parents gotta teach, we've got to train our children. We gotta talk to them, you know, in a God honor way, teach them the right way. Be honest with them. Don't don't leave it a chance. I gotta move. Watch it. So you have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy. For a greedy person is an idolater, idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Can, can we move? Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world. He's talking to the church. Don't forget that. But now is the time to get rid of. If you're going to have the mind of Christ, if you're going to lose your mind. One of the signs of you losing your mind is you got rid of unrighteous anger. He says anger. He's talking about unrighteous anger because we know that there's a righteous indignation, right? The Bible says be angry and sin not. Some of y'all getting angry when you're sinning. How do you know you're angry when you're sinning? When you're cursing, using profanity, when you're throwing stuff. When you're using derogatory words, when, you, when you're doing, you know, just anger, rage. You don't have the mind of Christ when you go into a rage. Something's wrong with you. Let the word deal with you. I'm telling you, okay? But now's the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. There it is in the Bible. So don't give me this excuse. All Christians cuss. No, all Christians do not cuss. And when you curse, it's wrong. That's dirty language. All right. So this week, I, I, that, just, that just came out. I, I, know, I know many of y'all, and I got to go, many of y'all probably saw the, 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 the video went viral, Kirk Franklin, when he, he got upset with his son. And use some profanity. And he, I give it to me. Apologize. He he came out front. He got ahead of it. He didn't sit back. And some people just some people were dialing in, and some of y'all were too. Well, yo, yo, you, sometimes you gotta let them have it like that. No, <laughs> he was wrong for addressing it that way. Now I'm not saying he wasn't wrong for addressing his his, his kid because there, there's a whole lot to that story that we don't know about. So quit talking and pontificating about stuff you have no clue of the whole story. All right? But it was wrong for him to do it that way. It was wrong for his son to, to put him on blast. Why do y'all put people on blast? You may not go to social media, but you go around the church, being a church gossip. Have you heard? Somebody told me. Now, I don't know if it's true or not, but well, if you don't know it's true or not, 
shut your mouth. <laughs> Gossiping is a sin. You know that, don't you? All right, I'm about out of time. But now's the time to get rid of anger, rage, malice, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Get rid of that, guys. It's a poor testimony. I mean, if, if you struggle with that, that means you got to replace your mind. you got to lose your mind and get the mind of Christ. Christ didn't go around doing that. Talking away. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all this, all this wicked deeds. Next verse says, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become what? Like him. Verse 11, in this new life, it doesn't matter if you are, watch this, guys. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. It don't matter if you're black or white, Asian or Hispanic. He says, in this new life, in this new life, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters. And he lives in all of us. You ought to clap on that. So I, I, I got to stop. I got to stop. Lastly, he gives you circumstances. Y'all know Romans 8 and 28. All things work together for the good, for those who love the Lord, for those who are called according to his purpose. God will use circumstances. And I'll pick up on next week on how he uses circumstances. And I'm just, I hadn't even gotten to the meat of what we're going to talk about. <laughs> because we've got to do a deep dive into how do we as a church embrace the mind of Christ, develop the mind of Christ, and don't let our culture, don't let our political persuasion influence the way we think about life. And we can get to that point to where we can be real and we can speak truth. It doesn't matter who, who we have to speak it to. Some folks are afraid to speak truth to power. Some people are afraid to tell the truth when they're in a meeting uh, with their coworkers. And you say, well, I ain't going to say nothing. Well, you need to learn to speak truth wherever you are. God is trying to change us. I don't know about you, but I need to change. I have not arrived, and God is still working on me. That's my testimony. And if, if you're really honest, you'll, you'll be, you, I think you'll say the same thing. God is still working on us. And guys, he's working on this church. He's changing the way we do ministry. He's taken us from an inward focus of come to us to an outward focus. We're going to come to you. We're going to take what we learn. We're going to get, we're going to get taught. We're going to get discipled and we're going to go to our various places, our neighborhoods, our schools, our places of employment, the ball games. And we're going to begin to represent Christ in those spaces that we find ourselves in. And our Christianity will be more about than just coming together on Sunday morning. I thank God for you guys. So my question is that close. Have you lost your mind completely? I think some of us have lost our mind, but we haven't lost it completely. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Philippians 2 and 5. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Every head bowed by close. Father, we thank you. And we praise you for this day. We give you glory. And we thank you right now for the awesome privilege. Mm. Lord, I know you want to change us. You're changing our mind. You're changing our hearts. So right now, Father, speak to the hearts of those who are listening. And we call out your name because you are able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works in us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 